Okay, welcome everybody. It is the middle of July and we're full on summer. Welcome to Hebrews. Andy's going to start us off in a word of prayer. Okay, Our dear Lord, we thank you so much for for giving us this time of life, for for letting us have such beautiful days and um, experience the warmth of your sun and the warmth of, of the fellowship with your people uh, and that joy of comes from getting into your word together and, and learning, learning from your words. Uh, please bless us tonight and help make us uh, more like you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Andy. Welcome. So to start off tonight. I'll tell you what I've discovered the difference in uh, summer in Virginia and summer in Texas. We were watching the weather the other night and they started talking about how many days in Virginia that we will have been over 90 degrees. And I think we're closing in on the record. In Texas, we don't even mention the temperature unless it's over 100. So well. there, there's that, just so you... I know you think it's hot, but, uh, and it probably is hot for here, but it could be worse. That's all I'm saying. So you're probably. suggesting that living in Texas is the definition of worse, and, and I would agree. Yes, I, I, could, I, could, <laughs> I could go for that, especially <laughs> this time of year. Well, no, Death Valley ain't too pleasant either, though. No, there's a reason they call it Death Valley. <laughs> You're not supposed to live there. Yeah. <laughs> True. So Hebrews 5, we're, we're still continuing and building with our theme of how Christ is better. And we really come to uh, maybe the final point in, in that line of thinking. And then going from here, uh, the writer is going to continue to build. And, and tonight he really... Uh, hones in on how Christ is qualified and a better high priest. And then there are several factors in that. And so we'll just take a look at that uh, tonight. Chapter five, verse one, every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God. So, so let's just, point there obviously uh the high priest is a man and jesus meets that qualification and he represents the people in matters of of god and specifically the the most important function for the high priest uh was the day of atonement um what, what do you know about the day of atonement andy Oh, it's just I knew it's called Yom Kippur, I guess. It's, it, yeah, it's it referred to as Yom Kippur is its official name. What else do you know? Oh, it was when the the um, priest sacrificed and went into the all, into the Holy of Holies, right, to offer. Exactly, and and, and so Yom Kippur. The Day of Atonement's a little different than the other Jewish uh, feast because it's actually the opposite of a feast. It's a very uh, somber day. There were five prohibitions during the Day of Atonement. Uh, no eating or drinking, so there was obviously no feasting. Uh, for some reason, they couldn't wear leather shoes during... Uh, Yom Kippur. There's no bathing or washing. Uh, there's no uh, anointing oneself with perfumes or lotions. And uh, there's no marital relations during Yom Kippur. The idea uh, they suggest is that you try to make your body somewhat uncomfortable, but show that um, you still survive. Um, and by doing so, you, you're feeling uh, pain, 
and you can understand how others would, would feel that pain, be in pain. And that, that was kind of the purpose. Everybody suffered together. And so um, I think it's very fitting that Christ is seen as this high priest. And as we're going to see tonight, he uh, knows how to suffer along with his people. Uh, the history or, or the tradition is that the first day of atonement was after the 40 days that Moses was up on the mountain and in response to the golden calf. So they, that, uh, that's the first day of atonement. Aaron is high priest. And then very much showing that he's different from Jesus <laughs> needing to be atoned for his sin of leading the people in wor worshiping the golden calf. Any other thoughts there? Uh, another way they often referred to the Day of Atonement, it was the Sabbath of Sabbaths. So uh, high holy day. Um, and it usually lasted... They started a little bit early and they went a little bit later. And so usually this fasting was about a 25 hour uh, time period, not just, uh, not just the uh, 24 hour day. So let, let's pick up uh, with the reading verse three. He related to get, he, he related to uh, the people and matters of, to God and it says to offer gifts and sacrifice for sins. So the high priest was the man to approach God to make offerings and sacrifices. And it wasn't just a single uh, sacrifice, but there were several different sacrifices that would take place on the Day uh, of Atonement. By Jewish Tradition, there were three ways to atone, or three parts of atoning to God. First, you had to pray. And then you had to repent of your sins. And then you had to give uh, to charity. And all of that was um, tied up together in this idea of atonement. It wasn't just... Um, a, a, a mental asking for your sins to be uh, forgiven. It was an interaction with God. It was a change in you through repentance and then an outward sign of, uh, of giving. And, and so um, is the atonement for God or is it for us in the sense of understanding what God is doing? That's, that's kind of a question I like to set with sometimes because we take a very transactional view of things, but I think there's, a, and certainly that's, that's part of what's happening here, the offering of, of gifts and sacrifices. Um, but it's not just an appeasement for God. It's also for what it does within us. And so, and so that's something I like to reflect on and think about. Um, what does realizing my sin do to me? How does it help me uh, change when I am um, transparent, honest, open uh, about my sin? So let's continue verse two. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. So another reason that Jesus can be our high priest is because of his experiences, because of him being a man, he can deal gently. And the idea here is to be in the middle. It doesn't mean to say, well, it's indifference. He doesn't care about sin. And it's not to be so grieved by the sin that we are uh, paralyzed. But he knows how to bring us through that sin 
and to deal with in a way of understanding. Because a lot of times our thinking's wrong, we're ignorant, uh, we, we allow our desires to lead us astray, our, our ways of solving our problems. And here's an interesting uh, thing I've been thinking about today. You know, this intention of dealing gently with the people's sins would have been expected of all of the high priests from Aaron on, but they weren't very good at that. It's easy for us to take that as a, an authority position, a position of power, and turn it into something that it's not. And now Jesus comes along and maybe for the first time, probably for the first time, was fully able to deliver on that ability to deal gently with those because with us because he was subject uh, to this weakness. He, he, so he's in the middle. He's not irritated and he's not annoyed. It's not I can't believe they did it again, like we often do when somebody keeps repeating, aren't they over that? Why are we still having to deal with that? The high priest should have the ability to understand the, the weakness and the temptations of a man. And, and now Jesus comes and he's the first one to fully be able to do that. Verse three, this is why he has to offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. So with all of these uh, high priests that are in the line of Aaron, they all had sins, and so they had to offer sacrifices for sins. Jesus is different, plain to us that he offered sacrifice for sins, but not his sin. And so that sets him apart. But I think the key in verse three is this positions by divine appointment, not because it was leveraged, not because uh, somebody had earned it, but it's because God has called them. So if you remember the story of the sons of Korah, they, they stood up and wanted to offer another way of uh, sacrificing to God, and it didn't turn out so well for them. And, and so I think the key here is Jesus was man. He's also divinely called by God. Verse, verse 5, in the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, you are my son, today I become your father. And it says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So uh, Jesus is different as a high priest because his order, where he comes from, is different. Because he is son and he's from a different lineage. And this makes him better than the lineage of Aaron. What do you know about Melchizedek? So the first time we run into Melchizedek was when uh, Abraham brings offerings and sacrifices to him. So one thing that's different from Melchizedek than Aaron is that Mel Melchizedek was a king. Oh, guess what? Jesus is also the king. Melchizedek was the king of Salem, which the Hebrew word Salem means peace. And Jesus is called the prince of peace. So there, there's, he's in alignment with Melchizedek again. And Melchizedek, the name means king of righteousness. And so Jesus 
is from that same lineage. He is the king who rules with righteousness. And the writer goes on to, to build uh, that idea. Now, I'll just tell you, verse uh, 7 through 10, there's a lot of discussion. You can read page after page of all that different people think is trying to be uh, said here, but I want to just kind of uh, keep it in the context of what I think the writer is saying here and, and not try to make it say too much, but to support uh, what, uh, what the writer's trying to do here. Because he's trying to show how Jesus uh, is son, but he's also from this different lineage of priest, this king priest that's different uh, from Aaron. So in verse 7, it says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petition, petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. So what in the world's going on there? When was that? Well, the most obvious thought is the garden when Jesus prayed that this cup pass. And, but what does it mean he was heard because of his reverent submission? What was he asking for in, in the garden? And, and so that's where a lot of the different um, ideas come in, exactly what Jesus was asking for. But for me, put it in the context of what we're talking about here and his ability to understand uh, the suffering and, and the weakness of being human, of, of, of living here on this earth, is, is, is the idea of uh, facing death and, and the fear that, that can come with that. And I hear in that that because he was submissive, that he was not abandoned, that uh, he was able to fulfill what he came to do, even though everything in him wanted to do something different. The idea of when we do the right thing, even when it's not easy or pleasant for us, and sometimes then we come out on the other side um, and, and we're, we're in a different place. We're stronger. We've grown through that. Uh, that that's what I hear at this point. So I've mentioned before, I've, I took kids to the mountains and, and we did backpacking. And one of the things we tried to do on every trip was a summit attempt. And it is hard to describe it if you've never been in the Rocky Mountains or any other large mountain range and got above tree line and, and try to work your way to the summit where oxygen is thinner and it's uphill every step of the way. You're exposed. It's just very difficult. Even if you're in great shape, it's often difficult and a struggle. And what I discovered was uh, the hardest year wasn't the first year. You know, a young kid, a, a ninth grader would go on trek and they'd be excited. They've heard the stories. Um, but you can't really explain how difficult it was going to be. And it was actually harder the second year that you came back because you knew how bad it was going to be and how much it was going to hurt. But you also knew what was on the other side of that. And I hear that sentiment here that uh, Jesus knew what he was about to face. Um, and it wasn't so much he was trying to get out of it as much as needing uh, the support of God to get through it. And because of that, he is now uh, better prepared and he has brought us something different. So look, look at verse eight. 
son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once more made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. And he was designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So like us, like his brothers, he learned submission. He didn't honor himself. He didn't say, you know, I'm greater than this. I shouldn't have to do this. Uh, I was trying to think of a way to illustrate this. And I thought about the elders I worked with in Lufkin. One thing that just impressed me by, uh, uh, by them, uh, or one way I was impressed by them, was uh, anytime we had anything at church, they were in the middle of it. When cleanup was happening, they were the, you know, they were leading the charge. I, I've been part of other churches where, when it came time to clean up, the leader disappeared. <laughs> uh, that was kind of beneath them. They didn't do that kind of work. That was for somebody else. And so I had a lot of respect for the Lufkin elders because uh, they were no different than everybody else. They learned, in a sense, obedience by being part of, of what I would call grunt work, of, of enduring all the, the pain and suffering that comes from cleaning which is usually not on high on anybody's list. So that's a much lower example of what I think Christ was doing through his, his learned obedience. And for me, the idea here is that the Aaron priesthood is gone and not that it was replaced by Jesus. It's been superseded by Jesus. So it's not just a plug and play. This is the new model. It's something beyond what the uh, Aaron priesthood could have ever done. So let me just pause there, see if there's any comments, any feedback on what's happening there. It's interesting that Jesus being God, the writer here talks about his obedience. Yes. Jesus never stopped being part of the Godhead, but it was important to understand that the powers that he was granted as being a part of the Godhead were not what he used to get through his human suffering, and particularly as related to the cross. And, uh, and so you know, I've always kind of read that and understood that Jesus had options. Yes. And his obedience was that he chose not to use the powers that had been granted to him to fulfill the requirements for our salvation. Jesus prayed that God take it from him, but he had it well within his power to not suffer the cross. Yeah. He didn't have to ask God for permission. It was well within his <laughs> authority, well within his power to not, not be put on the cross. And, and I think the idea there in verse nine, building on that, Jeff, he was made perfect. That's not, that's not there referring to his sinlessness. He's made perfect in his obedience. He was perfectly obedient. He didn't go halfway as you're suggesting, even though he had other options. Yeah, I like that a lot. That's helpful. Andy, any other thoughts you want to add there? Oh, no. That sounds good. So we get to verse 11. Um, he's going to kind of shift gears on us. We're going to leave this idea of uh, Melchizedek. It's kind of like he says, time out. I want to make a side point here. Even though he's been building all this point, he's going to get back to it in the next uh, few chapters but but here he's he's going to remind them why we're doing this why he's talking about these things why it's important for them to understand that the ways of Aaron are gone the ways of Moses are gone the ways of Joshua are gone they've been superseded by Jesus and it's that we need to make progress 
<laughs> it's not just about getting past the line and going, okay, we're there, we made it, we can stop. It, it's about continuing to make progress. So he's going to rebuke them about their maturity. He's going to talk about the possibilities of, of falling away and he's going to try to inspire them to hold on uh, to the hope that they have. And by hope, it's not a wish. It's not something, oh, wouldn't that be great? But the certainty of what comes from being uh, connected to Christ. So let's look at verse 11. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. So it's kind of like somebody saying, okay, I know how to add. I don't need any more math. Well, adding is important. This is not something that's not important. Um, you, yes, you have to learn the ABCs, but let's not stop there because you also miss the depth and um, the greater meaning that, that can be there for us. He, he, he continues in verse 12. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not equated acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So, so let's talk about that picture there. Um, so a Jewish teacher would get his disciples and his disciples would learn everything that he told them. But to become a teacher meant you were, you were going beyond just what you had been told, learning and regurgitating the test, and were able to think for yourself. So I don't think the text here is saying, well, everybody ought to be teachers in a formal sense. But what he's trying to point out is like a teacher that we need to be able to, to go beyond the elementary, the first principles, the simple things, and, and be thinking for ourselves, taking what we've learned and applying it uh, to life. So religion is not just give me the rules and let me follow the rules. In a sense, that's what the law was like. And anybody who approached that it was just about fulfilling the letter of the law did not understand fully what God was asking them to do. Love, your Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength is way beyond the letter of the law. There's no, uh, there's no checkbox under that where you said, okay, I've done that all. I've loved God. And therefore, I can take time off. It, 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 it doesn't work that way. And certainly, wisdom, particularly in an Eastern and a Jewish sense, is something much different. So sometimes we want to uh, just tell me the right answer. We don't want to what, what are all this argument? If there was truth, you just say what the truth is and get it over with. And we have trouble understanding the deeper things, uh, holding paradox, having multiple levels. See, I think the Bible is like a good Pixar movie. There's plenty for the kids, but there's also a, a level of humor and enjoyment that goes over the kid's head and it's targeted at the adults. Okay. And, and, and so I hear him saying, don't, 
just learn the ABCs and quit. You, you're missing the good stuff. If you want to drink milk the rest of your life and that's all you get, th there's a lot more uh, to life than that. And part of it is found in the wrestling. So, so I wanted to illustrate what I'm trying to say here and what I think uh, the writer is getting at. Because sometimes we do treat the Bible like a rule book. If we just learn the rules, we'll know what to do in every situation. Well, uh, the Bible doesn't support that idea. So here's Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. Verse 4 says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. So if we're treating that as a rule book, we go, oh, that makes sense. Don't answer full. But the problem is there's verse five. <laughs> verse five says just the opposite. Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. So within two verses there, it gives the opposite advice. It gives the opposite instruction. And so some people have looked at that and said, well, uh, the Bible doesn't make sense. It doesn't even know how to answer a fool. It tells you one thing and then the other. Well, I don't think that's what's being said there. Because it is not just a simple, if I learn a few little rules, my life will be, everything will fall into place. What's the difference? Well, it calls for wisdom. And with wisdom, you understand that sometimes when a fool speaks, you don't answer them. And other times when a fool speaks, you need to answer them. How do you know the difference? Well, you have to, de you have to develop wisdom. And, and I think the danger here in and why he's spending this time rebuking them about their immaturity is if you just get the starting point, you you lose the richness, the growth, and the help that is uh, coming from God by not understanding uh, the deeper things. Because as life goes on, things often get more complicated and they're not always simple answers. And if you if we don't spend the time wrestling and talking and working through them, we we will think we should just solve everything with simple platitudes when it, it's not enough, the circumstances are too complex. Does that connect? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think the, yeah. the writer of Hebrews spends a lot of time on this because his, his main focus seems to be to make the Jews understand that their identity is no longer Jew, yeah. it's Christian. Yeah. And, and it was very, I mean, not just the writer of Hebrews, but several of the writers in the New Testament spent a tremendous amount of time explaining to Jews that being a Jew wasn't good enough. <laughs> and that if you keep trying to mix these two, you're going you're gonna to continue to endanger your salvation. Yeah. You, you'll go back to depending on the things you were depending on that were inadequate and were short and weren't enough. Right. Being a good Jew is not going to get you to heaven. <laughs> That's the, uh, you know, yeah. if you want to summarize the writer of Hebrews, he's going to say, yeah. you can be a good Jew. And you'll miss salvation. <laughs> and and you don't need to do that. Because <laughs> Jesus is greater. <laughs> yeah. And, and if you think about that, that should be attractive. And I think that's why he's making this case. Um, 
you know, we're going to start talking about Acts on Sunday morning. And, and I think part of the struggle of the early church was uh, when Jesus said he was coming back, they thought it was right then. And they didn't necessarily think very far ahead to plan for these kind of transitions because they thought the time was short. And I see the writer here, as Jeff is saying, um, he, he's preparing them uh, because it may not be an immediate return. And, and so don't just stop and say, I have enough uh, because it won't sustain you. And there's, there's more and greater uh, to be had in Christ. In fact, uh, the word he used earlier in the chapter was eternal salvation. It wasn't this yearly salvation that came with the line of Aaron, where every year they offered sacrifices again. And we're, and we're not there yet. It's one of my favorite parts of Hebrews, is Christ was a sacrifice once for all. So another way he is um, set apart from uh, the Jewish faith. So when you hear these words, um, you know, I want to talk to you more, but uh, you, but it's hard for you to hear. Uh, one, one translation said, you're dull of hearing. Here it says, it's hard for me to make it clear to you. Uh, maybe the picture is, it, it's like, it's as frustrating as trying to communicate with a deaf person. It certainly couldn't happen, but if I don't know sign language and they can't hear me, it's going to be it's going to be a very rudimentary uh, communication. But if they can open their ears, if they can hear what this writer is trying to tell them, they will be able. Uh, to communicate with God and what he has brought to them, this eternal salvation in a way that will, will um, produce maturity and growth in them. So that's chapter five. Jeff, you have any other thoughts or comments? Nope. Um, it's just, you almost get a sense that the, the Hebrews writer is really fighting not to let his frustration show through. <laughs> he's trying to, uh, he's, he's trying to uh, model what he says Christ does for us mm. by, uh, because of his sub submission, but at the same time, he understood our struggle. <laughs> uh, and it is sometimes when we have come through that struggle, uh, Hopefully, it produces in us a compassion for those that are are still struggling. And as a youth minister, it's that's an interesting job because I kept losing at the top and bringing in new and green people at the bottom. So it was it, it, you have to continually reteach stuff that you've taught before because the younger kids are just now getting there and experiencing it for the first time. And so uh, I think one of the reasons some people don't last a long time uh, is they get tired of that, having to go back and start over. But I found a lot of joy in starting with kids where they're at as a seventh grader and then seeing where they would be at a lot of them by the time they graduated high school and, and to get to um, experience that transformation with them and witness that. But I always sent them out saying, okay, I, I've come this um, far with you, uh, but you got, you got a long way to go. There's plenty of journey. There's plenty more that God's going to do. There's plenty more he's going to show you. This is not the end. This is just a transition point, and you need to pick somebody else up to walk with you the next steps. 
and, and that was kind of my vision as a youth minister that I was just uh, part of the journey because they went on uh, to other parts of life. And um, it was important to try not to become too frustrated by continuing having to go back to the same kind of things. But I, Jeff, I think you're right in, in that we're kind of sensing some of the motivation for him writing these things. But he also cares so much that he's going to be very plain and very straightforward. He's not going to pull back and hope they get it. He's going to be very direct, um, which can be risky. Some people may not want to hear that they're still drinking milk. <laughs> Okay, Denise has something to say. So it's interesting that he he compares them as infants. And if you think about an infant, they're selfish and they have an the understanding of only caring for themselves. Okay, so, what they need, so go ahead. can you hear Denise? Somewhat. But she's saying that it, she's uh, focusing on the fact that he's calling them infants, and infants are very selfish. They can only think about themselves. And so, you know, it's it's hard to think if everybody stayed in infant stage, what kind of world we would live in. And, you know, he's expecting more of Christians because who is going to listen to an infant who is selfish? Right. So she's saying if we're all infants, what kind of world is that going to be? <laughs> Who's going to listen to the infant that's that's pointed to themselves, thinking about themselves, always worrying about how they look? We need Christians who will offer the world something different. We understand with Christ his suffering, and we join him in that so that we can be a witness of maturity in the world, um, which that has imp interesting implications that we'll talk about as we continue to go through uh, Hebrews, but I think that is an important point. Um, he's trying to get them to not just be focused on themselves and what God has done for them, uh, but to see what Christ has done for us so that we can join him in that ministry as well. Yeah, thank you, Denise. All right, any other thoughts? Well, let, let's, let's have a word of prayer together. Father, I'm thankful tonight that we can have a time in your word, that we can be uh, focused on how you are bringing us to maturity. I, I ask that you always, through your spirit, challenge us to be a greater, uh, not, not in ourselves, but in your glory and in reflecting your glory so that we may be a witness to those around us. I thank you for Jesus, our high priest who understands us, who is different than the, the high priest that, that, that were from the law of Moses, that he's greater uh, than them. He is our king, he is our priest, and he is our brother, and we pray in his name. Amen. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. You're welcome. Glad everybody's here tonight. Have a good week, everyone. <laughs>